talk about the cardiovascular system. And I want to make a point of I'm concentrating now on the vessels, the vascular side of the whole thing. We've talked about the pump, the pump, I should say, or really the heart can be thought of as two pumps side by side. And that's why I kind of said that, I guess. But I want to bring down this nice drawing here that somebody's done, not me. And I'll just cover over that title. You saw that. And I just want to point out a few things. Remember, you have the pause button. You have the rewind button. I'm going to go kind of fast. But there is this pulmonary circulation. And that means the blood that leaves the right heart takes deoxygenated de blood to the lungs, gets oxygenated, and then comes back to the left side of the heart, which then gets pumped out to the aorta. So you should look at this diagram, pulmonary circulation, systemic circulation. I'll point out just one thing here. Uh, this depicts the liver. And it's very interesting. If you see the arrows, once one blood supply to the liver is called the hepatic artery. But lo and behold, down here, the liver gets another incoming blood supply. And it's called the portal vein. That's strange, isn't it? blood being supplied to an organ. Usually blood comes into an organ, like in the kidney here, and it goes out back to the heart. Very interesting stuff. But again, you can pause and read. But I do want to say that this is a simplified drawing, and there's millions of blood vessels, especially in this area. These are capillaries, and it's thought that maybe there's a billion capillaries. And my next three figures are going to show you that. I'm going to make it kind of fast, but again, you have the pause button. Okay, so there's a technique where you can put a special liquid into all the blood vessels of the body, let it set up, let's say, become hardened, and then digest the whole animal away except the vascular system, except that solution that was in the vascular system. You might call it a vascular cast. Here's one. A dog. I'll blow it up. You can see it. But that basically depicts all the blood vessels in the dog. There's not an area without blood vessels. I'll enlarge it even larger for you. You can pause and look. But pause. Not saying P-A-W-S, but pause. Anyway, here's another one. A human head. Look at that. The blood vessels are shown, showing, but nothing else is. Very interesting. Great uh, technique. Here's another one that shows a human body, and I'll even enlarge it. First of all, I'll let you look at there. If you want to pause it, you can look at that. I'm going to get here and show you uh, a couple things. Here's the kidneys. It's red on red, but I think you can see that. This is the person's right kidney because we're looking at the person. They're facing us. Here's the left kidney, but look at all the blood vessels. This would be the renal artery taking blood branching it from the aorta into each kidney. Wonderful stuff. Okay, so hopefully you're convinced there's a lot of blood vessels. There's hardly, you know, a place where there's not. So let me just show you this diagram of the cat, and maybe you should know some vessels. And again, you can pause this and look at it, but the jugular vein drains the head, often a place to get a blood sample from. The carotid artery, takes blood up to the brain. Now there's a left carotid, carotid artery and the right, so they're like what's called bilateral. There's two jugular veins, left, right. Cranial vena cava. Some people say there's two vena cavas because they never quite join before they go in the heart. They both kind of come into the heart. So the cranial vena cava is a vein that drains the upper part of the body, the head and so forth, and everything coming back from behind the heart is the caudal vena cava. Aorta, the main artery in the body, you can see there's a lot of branching. This diagram doesn't show you off, you know, all those branches. The femoral artery in the rear leg of the animal and uh, kind of a dangerous place because it's not that far below the surface and animals and people have been cut by sharp, sharp objects, uh, have had their femoral arteries cut and then they bleed to death. Don't want to be morbid, but I just want to say, hey, watch out for that thing. Okay, let me get rid of that and bring another one over. Here's a human model that shows you some of these same uh, vessels. And, of course, you can pause it and look at this, but you can see this doesn't depict all of them. 
as the casts have shown. Okay, now I want to get to the point that an artery is branching, branching, but the next branch is called an arteriole. And then there's many branches of that. And the arterioles lead into what's called the capillary bed. And maybe I'll encircle a capillary bed. Here's how you spell capillary. It's often called a capillary bed. There's many of these. This branching that's shown in this diagram probably doesn't do it justice. And then, we, could, of course, this arrow shows blood flow. So we're going from a high-pressure side to a low-pressure side. Once blood leaves the capillary bed, it goes into what's called a venule. So actually, some of, well, maybe we'll call this a venule as they've got a diagram. And then venules get together, two come together, and finally you get a vein, then you get a big vein, and then finally you're in the vena cava. This is a low-pressure side. So when you have blood flowing in a low pressure, it might want to go backwards. And therefore, there are one-way valves, which we'll talk about a little bit. So uh, the arterial side has no blood, uh, no valves, sorry. <clears throat> sorry. You should note that there's smooth muscle in these blood vessels. So that can constrict or relax. Now, let me get rid of that thing and show you maybe a little better diagram for labeling. It's the, the idea, again, it's not anatomically perfect because you'd have a lot more capillaries than this. But the kicker is you have the big aorta, blood flows through to the venous side, and it goes back to the heart in the vena cava. Down here, it's talking about flow rate. Flow rate, and the higher this line is, the faster it's flowing. So once you get to a capillary, incredibly slow flow. And I want to talk about that a little bit. It's estimated that in this region here, in the capillary bed, to travel one millimeter, it takes about five seconds. Now, a millimeter is incredible. It takes 25 millimeters to get an inch. So then I calculated that out, the blood in the capillary to travel one inch, the equivalent of one inch, would take two minutes. Think of it. Hold up with between two fingers an inch estimate and say it takes a red blood cell, two minutes to travel that inch. All the blood flowing through the capillary is going that slow. The reason that's important is the capillaries are where things leave the vessels and come into the vessels. Now, I do want to say that the previous diagrams left out one important set of vessels. So here's the kicker now. I want to talk about lymph vessels, or in this case, this diagram calls them lymph lymph capillaries. So remember, this is the arterial side. There's an arteriole. Arteriole. Blood is going to flow this way. Then it's going to go through this capillary bed, which is depicted in lighter, lighter red, and then blue, blue, blue. Okay. But the thing is, if you have 100 drops of blood come in this vessel, not 100 drops of blood leave in the venous system. I've never heard exactly the ratio, but I'm going to make this up, but it's going to be probably close. A hundred drops of blood come in, if you see where my red arrow is here, and 99 leave in the venule. That means we have one retained. Well, that could go on for a little bit, but after you retain too many drops, we'll talk about it. It's called edema. So the excess fluid that collects is actually picked up by the lymph capillary. Okay, and that's shown by arrows here. So maybe here's what I should have, you know, also said. Okay, blood comes in, blood fluid and the cells comes in this arteriole. They leak out, and I've got another diagram coming up, but fluid leaks out and cells can get out and a lot of things happen. The lymph then picks up this excess fluid, and once it gets in this green, it's not really green, but it's, they did it this way to contrast, then it's called lymph. And this is a lymphatic vessel here. And lo and behold, all the lymph ends up flowing back to the heart. So now, let me get rid of that one and bring this over. This shows a little bit better. I'll enlarge it as well. And this is kind of just like the other diagram, but it has a little more uh, explanation of what a lymph vessel is. And so this is cells that are here, like watch, that cell is this cell. So it's outside the vascular system. 
But lo and behold, then there is always fluid, fluid in cells. That's called intracellular fluid. And then here they've got blue to depict extracellular fluid. Well, that special extracellular fluid is called interstitial fluid. It's not in any vessel, but it's bathing cells. But as soon as that fluid moves from the interstitial space into a lymph vessel, which is outlined here in green, then it's called lymph. So interstitial fluid, when it leaves the tissue space and goes into this lymph vessel, now you've got to call it lymph. I would not call it interstitial fluid like it's saying here. I would like blot that out. Let me blot that out with something. I don't like that. Uh -uh. So what I'm saying is interstitial fluid is bathing cells, but as soon as it gets into the lymph vessel, we call it lymph. How's that editing on the fly? And then this lymph is going to go back towards the heart. This is a low pressure system as well, and so they have valves that prevent backflow. So veins and lymph vessels have one-way valves. That's a great diagram. Okay, another beautiful diagram that shows a blood vessel down here in the lower part. I'll, hopefully my red pointer is going to show up there. A blood vessel with a lymph vessel on the top here. And the arrows point depict things coming and going out of these vessels. Especially blood vessels, let's say a capillary. There's nutrients come out. That's glucose. Uh, other sugars, it could be amino acids, oxygen is going to diffuse. The fluid part of blood can come out, but not the blood cells, except a special exemption, exception to that, and I'll talk about it later. Waste that's generated by the tissue tends to go back into the blood, it can. Uh, carbon dioxide that the cells are generating. And so you take in oxygen into a tissue and you generate carbon dioxide. The lymph here, the lymph fluid, is in this vessel and some excess fluid moves in. Remember the 99 drops come out. Where's that other one drop? There it is right there. Some wastes go in. Uh, an antigen, we'll talk about that when we talk about Im immunology. But that could be a bacterium, okay? Uh, they're talking about how large proteins and some nutrients can get into the lymph vessel. But in the lymph vessel, you'll see there's no red blood cells. That's the other thing. Here in blood vessels, there's red blood cells. You know they're biconcave. There's white blood cells, too, depicted in blue here. They've got it labeled. You can pause this. In lymph vessels, there are white blood cells, but no red blood cells. Very interesting. Great diagram to digest. Pause and digest it. Okay, I just wanted to... Pick out another artist's illustration. This is a blood vessel. And why do I know it's a blood vessel? It might not be labeled. But remember how I said there's red blood cells and they're not in lymph. So although this might not be labeled, I know it's a blood cell, a blood vessel, sorry, like a capillary. The thing is, blood is flowing one way, but things are leaking. So another thing to take home, capillaries are leaky. Red blood cells, though, they have like pores and spaces between the cells that make up the capillary. Here's a monocyte. We're going to find out that's a type of white blood cell. White blood cells can do this because they can squeeze out. They have a brain. They have a nucleus. Red blood cells are brainless. They don't have a nucleus. So they can't say, oh, I'm going to stop here and work and get out. They just flow right by. So that's another beautiful diagram making sense of a blood vessel. Okay, so now I have a new uh, point to make here. And let me orientate you because I want to introduce uh, how one of the main driving forces of why things leave, especially the fluid, I guess I should say. So here's blood flow coming down. We're in a capillary. And there's interstitial fluid. The cells aren't depicted here, but you could draw cells in, and then, you know, the fluid between the cells is called inter interstitial fluid. Well, lo and behold, on the arterial end, now this is the arterial end of a capillary, and this is the venous end. Uh, I didn't see that down there. They did label that, but this is the arterial end. There's more pressure coming in here than going. So the pressure causes fluid to leave the capillary a net outward movement. It's called hydrostatic pressure. 
Whenever you see that term, that means there's a pump working or gravity can generate hydrostatic pressure too. But in this case, blood is being pumped. The pressure here is higher than down here, and that tends to force some fluid out those leaky capillaries. Lo and behold, on the venous end, the, flu the fluid pressure is a lot less. And so by osmosis, that's what osmotic pressure is, and we probably should have a lesson on osmosis. By osmosis, fluid will tend to go across this membrane into the capillary. You got to remember, osmosis is not due is not the same thing as hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so osmosis draws most of that fluid back in, except there's one drop left here, right? So I could say, a hundred drops of fluid leave the blood vessel, the capillary in this case. 99 drops get back in. That's almost all, but then there's one drop right over here, and that's got to go to a capillary, a uh, lymph capillary. And finally, I found you another great diagram. I'm going to go fast, but you can pause this again and look at it. Here's the arterial end, high pressure, oxygenated blood. It's going to move here. Then we're going to have tissue fluid with oxygen and food passes out. Food means glucose, but it could be a hormone. Here's a cell that could be a target cell for like the hormone testosterone. The capillary then is going to be flowing very slowly. Things can come back in. So basically this might be hydrostatic pressure or it also could be diffusion of like let's say a hormone. But then coming back in it's more osmotic pressure for the fluid and it could be diffusion like carbon dioxide diffuses into the capillary. Then when you get to the venous side Things are low pressure and you need those one-way valves. A drop of blood uh, flows this way, but if it had to, wanted to come back, it can't because these little flaps would close. The excess fluid, the excess interstitial fluid now, gets picked up by a blind-ended lymph vessel. Look it. That's the other thing you've got to remember. Lymph never is delivered to a tissue. Lymph is the result of this excess interstitial fluid that then gets put into a lymph vessel by probably a little pressure difference. And then lymph travels back to the heart. And this is a lymph node, we'll talk about that. This is kind of like where lymph can get filtered. Here's those one-way valves, large lymph vessels with valves, yes. And it's gonna go dump back in. And really this is very close to the heart where it finally gets dumped back in. It doesn't get dumped in just any old place. That's the end of this uh, lesson.